it is, but um, people are struggling with their health. Um, so stay safe, stay healthy, stay away from those that are sick. <laughs> um, I guess. Um, let me uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Right, uh, go ahead and get into it today. Actually, today, if you recall, when we went through the Book of Hebrews last year. Um, there's going to be a lot of similarity to one of those because um, it's a very similar topic of just understanding um, really what Christ gave up. And so as we get into this, um, you know, I think I might have asked a similar question back then, but what is something that you gave up that was of great value to you? It might not have actually been of much value to the rest of anyone else, but it was of great value to you. So what, what, what was the situation where you had to give up something of great cost to you. Tommy. Well, when I became a Christian, I had to give up all my grudges. I had to give up, I mean, I had to forgive. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, that was the biggest what I ever gave up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess uh, Tommy uh, had a lot of grudges in the past. <laughs> um, and, Couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> and then through becoming one with Christ, he realized that he had to give those up. And um, that is hard, especially if, for some, a grudge can be what motivates you. Um, like a, a very passionate grudge can, can actually be what drives you to do whatever, you know, whatever it is that you're seeking out to do. Um, okay, anything else? Anything else that was a great cost to you that you gave up? Time. Time. Okay. Like, example. <laughs> okay, so you know, really investing in others takes up a lot of your own time, right? Um, so much so that it can get to the point where you're like, like you don't have any time for yourselves because you're you're investing into others, and it can, it can become this struggle. And I've always noticed um, this is the first thing I, I realized once I became a working adult, right? Was that when I was in college? And it's different now because I don't understand college students now because college students are crazy busy now. I don't understand. When I was a college student, I had a lot of time. Time was not a problem. Right? Because, number one, I didn't go to class. <laughs> so that's part of it. But honestly, like, time, time wasn't a problem. My problem in college was money. Right? Like, you know, I didn't have enough money to do the things that I wanted. Right? So I had to, like, you know, I had to scrimp and save whatever I could, you know, I was, for us, um, you know Subway, Subway, uh, the, the, the sandwich shop, in, in, in my university, every Tuesday they had what they call two for Tuesdays, so they sold two six inch, so you got one foot long for $2.99, wow. now this doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> and it was like any, any sub, so even the most expensive sub, which for us, it was called the chicken pepino. The chicken pepino is basically a chicken parmesan sub with pepperoni on top. It's delicious. Two ninety nine. I went there every single Tuesday. Sometimes I would get more than one. And, you know, I would eat it for like a, a ladder meal. I have one for lunch, have one for dinner. And you know, the subway cards, I think at one point I had about five or six of them filled out. Um, because you still got the stamps, which I don't understand. But like, they still get all the stamps. So anyway, why am I talking about this? When, <laughs> once I graduated from college, I realized that money wasn't the, the main issue anymore because I was earning money as an engineer. Right? I had a lot of debt to pay and stuff, but I still had money that I could use. But I started to realize that time was my problem. And especially as, as a working adult, um, like, you know, your, your weekdays are pretty much like, you know, taken, taken over. Because you go to work, you come home and you're like, oh yeah, all this time, but you're tired. Right? You come home from work, the last thing you want to do is something. So as you come home, you know, the, the most that you'll do is you'll turn on the TV while you're like eating some like microwave dinner or something, I don't know. That's, that was my life back then. <laughs> um, and then, so what ends up happening is your weekends become the most precious like commodity. And like you guard your weekends as if it's like your, like, you know, the, like your treasure, right? And so, like, I realized that as, as I became a working adult, that time became a problem. And, and I'm sure as, you know, those of you that are married with kids, that's even more so, right? Um, even more expounded than I could even imagine. Um, for myself, I think I told this story before. 
the most precious thing I ever gave up was to go to junior prom. Um, I sold my Sega Genesis, so my video game console that was my life. I sold it for $80 um, because I spent something like $300 on junior prom. And I was working at the time at a pizzeria, but I was only making $4.25 an hour. So I wasn't making that much money, so I needed to make more money, so I sold my Sega Genesis, which for many years had been my entire life. And um, I kind of wish I never did that. Because <laughs> uh, nothing came out of that prom. <laughs> so much so that I never went, I didn't go to my senior prom, because I was like, that was a waste of time and money. I will never do that again. Um, yeah, and so many of you who know the story know that um, the person I asked, who I had a crush on for six years, she responded with the F word. Um, friend. Oh. Friend. <laughs> Which is worse than the other F word. <laughs> and so that basically yeah, destroyed six years of my life and my Sega Genesis. Great cost. Right, let's get into the word. Mark 8, verses 27 and following. We're going to go into the beginning part of chapter 9, but Mark 8, verses 27 and following. Where the Lord says this, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it, if, uh, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come in power, come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let, let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wish, just as it is written about him. Okay, so um, we're continuing on this theme of, of the Gospel of Freedom this year, and then we're going through the Gospel of Mark. After this, we'll be going through the book of Exodus and really just understanding that God desires us to be free of, of these many different oppressions and bondages in our lives. And as we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, um, you know, what, what's really, like, in the last part come over this is, you've been seeing this back and forth between Jesus and his disciples. And you've been seeing that they've been empowered, they've been equipped, they've been trained, they were sent out two by two. But then at the same time, even though they've been involved in his ministry, they still don't understand everything. 
there's a feeding on the 5,000, and they, they're just so out of their, their, like, they're so tired from what they have done that they can't even see the, the beauty and value of what Jesus is doing through that. So much so that when, when, they, when Jesus sends them off and he comes walking to them on water, they don't recognize who he is. They have been blinded by the world. They have been hardened. And so Jesus does this again, right? There's the feeding of the 4,000, which we went over last time. The feeding of the 4,000, he does it again. And, and they're still not getting it. And then you see, you know, he starts talking about, about the yeast of the, of the Pharisees and Herod and talking about all these outside influences that are distracting them and blinding them. And then you see this, this miracle where he heals this man at Bethsaida. But the man immediately doesn't get his sight. It happens over time. Jesus does it twice. And through that, I think he's teaching the disciples a lesson. That you guys don't see everything as crystal clear as you should. But don't give up. Because you will. And so we see that here, right from the beginning, Peter makes the broad proclamation, you are the Messiah. Some of your translations might say, you are the Christ. Okay? And so here, Peter is finally showing that he's starting to see some of the truth. He doesn't see Jesus as just some miracle worker or, or just another prophet. He's starting to recognize that Jesus is truly the Son of God. And so just to give you a, a broad understanding of what Messiah means, like very simply, it comes from the verb to anoint. So Messiah means anointed one in Hebrew. Um, the, the word Christ is actually the Greek translation of anointed one, right? So Christos is the translation of Messiah. So when we, when we say Jesus Christ, we're basically saying Jesus, the anointed one, right? Um, but when you look in the Old Testament, there are times within it where the word Messiah is used for kings. Because God is using these different kings to exercise his own plan. And some of those times, those kings were not Jewish. Um, I think it was, uh, who was it? Cyrus. Cyrus was, Cyrus was actually called one of the Messiahs, and he was a Persian king. And the thing is, this concept of Messiah is still embedded in Judaism and Islam. Both of those other religions still claim that a Messiah figure is coming. But the main difference between their understanding of Messiah and the Christian understanding is that our Messiah Jesus is the Son of God. Okay? In Islam and Judaism, it might just be some earthly person who God uses. Okay? But for us, Jesus is the Son of God. And we'll get to this later on in Mark 14, but just like the kings who were anointed, just like King David and King Saul were anointed, Jesus also was anointed by a woman. Now, we've already studied this when we went through the Gospel of John. And you see this woman with, with her perfume, you know, that alabaster jar, anointing Jesus. So Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. And Peter makes this amazing proclamation while everyone else is saying, well, you know, some of you, some are saying that you're John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets, blah, blah, blah. Peter says, no, you are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. So Peter's eyes are starting to become unblinded. But unfortunately, right after that, Jesus takes them aside and he starts teaching. And you can actually tell from the context that there are many people other than the disciples here. And Jesus is like, okay, this is what's going to happen. The Son of Man's got to suffer. The Son of Man's got to be rejected by all these different people. Then the Son of Man's going to be killed and rise again. He basically gave the whole game plan. Right? Jesus sat them down and told them exactly what is going to happen over the next, I think it's like a couple weeks. Right? He's telling them exactly what's going to happen. And Peter pulls him aside and says, no, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, this isn't what you're going to do, okay? Let me tell you what you're going to do. <laughs> so so Jesus, like Peter, right after he says, you are the Messiah, you are the anointed one, he hears these things. Jesus tells him exactly what he's, what's going to happen to him. And Peter's like, no, no, no. <laughs> this is what's going to happen. He takes him aside and he starts rebuking Jesus. Like, imagine this. Someone rebuking Jesus. Right? <laughs> after seeing everything Jesus has done, after seeing all these crazy miracles, all these profound teachings, that Peter has been with Jesus for quite some time at this point, and he rebukes him, right? Rebuke is a strong word, right? Like, the context of most rebuking is like a parent scolding a child, right? Which, you've been rebuked many times, right? <laughs> and so, so, like, that's the, the, so, for someone to do this, a disciple of Jesus to rebuke his own master. That's, that's 
pretty audacious. And so Jesus turns it around. And he comes back with an even stronger view. Get behind me, see? Right? It's like, whoa. <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> and, and so what, what, what Peter, what Jesus claims is that you're not speaking from the place of, of what, the, what is good for the kingdom. You're not speaking from the place of what God desires. You are speaking from the world. What does that mean? The thing with Messiah is that the Jews wanted someone who was going to restore the kingdom of Israel. Right? They wanted someone who was going to free them from Rome, was going to make them this relevant kingdom with an awesome temple. They always look back to the time of David as like, man, those were great times. Someone's going to come back and bring us back to that time. That was, that was how small their vision was. And so that was what was motivating Peter. When he pulled Jesus aside and he started rebuking him, his intention was to see this happen. And Jesus is like, no. That's just what the world wants. That's what you guys want. That's what you guys have dreamed for. But I have so much, I have something much better planned. I'm talking about bringing you, not freedom from Rome, but freedom from the spiritual oppression you've been over ever since the beginning of time. I want to bring an end to sin. I want to lead you into a true exodus where you can experience true freedom and have a relationship with not just some distant God, some almighty God who's over there doing his thing, but a God who wants to be your father. Jesus had something else in mind. Peter didn't understand that yet. So unfortunately, we see for a moment Peter showing great spiritual insight, showing clear vision, and then right afterwards, he fails again. Right afterwards, he's still distracted by something else. And so Jesus starts going on and talking about how, you know, if you want to be a disciple of mine, then you need to pick up your cross and follow me. Now, this must have been very confusing because for us, we read this down and we're like, oh yeah, sure, that makes sense. But remember, Jesus has not been crucified yet. So I'm sure when he said, pick up your cross, they're like, say what? <laughs> like, that's what people do when they get executed, Jesus. What are you talking about? Like, that must have really just kind of been a very key word that just kind of came out of the blue. Because they had no idea what was going to happen. And that was the primary form of the most humiliating execution you could have in that time. And so Jesus made a very big statement when he said, you need to pick up your cross. Which literally means you are walking to your death. The people that follow me are those that are willing to pay that cost. Who are willing to, to pick it up daily. Follow me deny themselves. We'll get into that in a little second. Um, so after that, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and they, they go up to a mountain. Right? He takes them away from the big crowds. He takes them away from the cities. He takes his inner crew. This is like Jesus' inner posse. Right? So he has his twelve, but these are the, the ones that he is the closest with. Peter, James, and John. Right? And he takes them up to this mountain and we have what they call the transfiguration. Now this, uh, this always kind of cracks me up when I think about it because um, first it says Jesus is transfigured, right? Like, what does that even mean? Like, what does that even look like? Like all of a sudden, like Jesus, like I don't know, like I, maybe I watch too many, like I don't know, sci-fi or anime where like there's like this amazing transformation scene. You know, there's, there's like. I used to watch Sailor Moon. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit this, but there's a the transformation scene. It's like it's like it was like Jesus doing something like this, and he like becomes just like stunning white Jesus, right? Like you know, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but you have this transfiguration, and 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 then immediately it says Moses and Elijah show. How do the how do these guys even know that that's Moses and Elijah? Right? Moses and Elijah have been dead for hundreds of years. How do they know? Is it, was it, do they have like a name tag? Like, hello, my name is Moses. <laughs> or did they show up and Jesus be, was like, hey, Chucky's so good. Like, he's like, introduce yourselves. He's like, I don't, I, I don't know. But like, they show up and they just know that it's Moses and Elijah. Right? 
And Peter's just not even thinking. He's like, oh, oh, oh this is great. You guys are here. Yeah. Um, just want to know. But, but like, let's, let me make a tent for, for each and every one of you. And so he's just, you know, the passage even says like, he was frightened. He didn't know what he was saying. And so this, this is this crazy scene. Now, a couple of things to note is that this happens on a high mountain. And, and in the Old Testament, a lot of things happen in a high mountain. And, and a lot of scholars like to say the mountain represents a place where man can meet God. Right? And they, they talk about this. Um, but, you know, the mountain was where, where Moses went and, you know, he, he met God at Mount Sinai. You know, he was there for a month. There's like this, this, this flame coming down and, and he receives the Ten Commandments, right? He receives the law. That's one mountain. For, for Elijah, you know, the, the, you know there's, there's, there's mountain, like, you know, I believe the, the place where he challenges the, 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 like the prophets of, of Baal were, were, was on a mountain place where the, where the fire came down. And so it's always represented this thing. But what's going on here is Peter has made this amazing confession that Jesus is the anointed Son of God, the anointed one, the one that they have all been waiting for. And Jesus is finally showing them what you said is true. And God himself even starts to, like this is the, like, God talks all the time in the gospel. You know, we've been going through like the, the gospel of John, and he just talks, right? And he's like, you know, I will be glorified through this one. And then like, you know, during the, during the baptism, like God just proclaims all these things. And again, God just says, this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. And only these three men were there to hear this. But they heard it. And so God is making his stamp clear that what Peter said is true. Jesus is the Son of God. And now we are going on to what will be His glory. This is kind of a turning point in the Gospel of Mark. Up until this point, you've seen the works of Christ, but you've seen a lot of confusion about who He is. And from this point on, there's no more confusion, but now Jesus is moving toward His last, his last moments on earth. So this is the big shift in this book. Is it's been building up. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Bam, here it is. Transfiguration is that turning point. But now it's moving on to his glory. And so Jesus is like, okay guys, don't say anything until I rise from the dead. And they're like, what? <laughs> what is he talking about? What does this mean? And so um, he goes on and they ask him about, well, well what about Elijah? Didn't, why do the prophets or why do the Pharisees all say that Elijah, the teacher of the law say Elijah is going to come first? And this comes, from a, this comes from a prophecy in the book of Malachi. And Jesus is like, yeah, he already came. And they've already done what they want to him. And we know this because in a previous chapter it was explained how John the Baptist was killed. So John the Baptist was that Elijah that was to return. That, that one to prepare the way for the Lord. And so all of this is being confirmed. And what is very clear in this passage is that Jesus says, as the Messiah, I am here to suffer. Now the thing is, a lot of the Jewish understanding of Messiah comes from the book of Isaiah. Right? And they see it mostly, as I said before, as someone who would restore the kingdom of Israel but when you really look at the book of Isaiah, they have what they call the servant songs. And these songs are about a servant who will suffer. Right? It talks about how this servant will be like a lamb led to the slaughter. This is, is what Isaiah was talking about. But for some reason, they didn't catch this. And Jesus is confirming this. I am here to suffer. But this is, for my, this is my glory. My glory is the cross. When you're taking up that, like when I'm taking this cross up, this is for my glory. This is something that we see in the Gospel of John again and again. Jesus keeps calling this the hour. And he's talking about the hour of his glorification. And so again, when it talks about the way of the cross, for us, brothers and sisters, the question is, will we deny ourselves? Will we pick up our cross? Now let me try to clarify this as best I can. Um, a lot of times when I, I meet random Christians, um, it seems like the understanding of denying yourself 
is to basically throw everything away, right? Um, so it's like you're going down this path, you know, let's say like, you know, you're on the path to be like a medical doctor or whatever, and um, you, you read this passage and then like, Jesus wants me to deny myself. I throw it all away. You know, it's like that song, I throw it on the ground. <laughs> I throw it all away, right? And they're like, I'm going to be a missionary. And everyone always, back, back when I grew up, Africa was the scary country. So it's like, I'm going to be a missionary in Africa. What? Oh, that's crazy. And now everybody's like, I'm going to go to the Middle East. That's crazy. So, so it's like, that's, that's the concept many have in Christian circles of what denying yourself is. <laughs> and for some, that might be true. For some, God might be calling you to that. And we can see in history that God has used people that have done this in the past. So that, that might possibly be the case. But I think the really important thing is the last part, following him. Because in that same way, God might be leading you down that path so you can be a missionary in that field. Right? To be that successful medical doctor who's able to not only be excellent in their practice, but to be someone that shows Christ in everything that they do. Right? Now picking up your cross, you know, again, this is that, that, that attitude of, of dying to yourself for the sake of God, but that doesn't necessarily literally mean you're dying to yourself. Well, brothers and sisters, that's the challenge of the text today is, what does this all mean? Now, I think one of the key things is, Jesus talks about, you know, the, the sinful and adulterous generation. And so what, he, what I think he's really showing that, uh, showing through that is that the, the just simple act of following Jesus automatically puts you in a place where you aren't like everybody. And that in itself will bring persecution and suffering. That's, that's just, uh, there's no way around it. And so what I, I want to challenge us today is, what does this mean to me? What does this mean to you? What does denying yourself mean to you? Now remember, Jesus scolded Peter for, 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 for rebuking him because his, his desires were that of Israel. Right? He wanted to see Israel come to power. But God had something else greater intended. And so some of us might have good intentions with whatever we're doing. But the question you have to ask is this is what God wants. It might be good. It might even seem very holy. It might even seem very righteous. But is this truly what God wants? Because for me, the most important thing is to follow Him. That means denying myself of certain things. That means letting go of certain things. Okay? Things more precious than a Sega Genesis. Right? Things of greater value. And so the thing is, there will be times in your life where you will have to give up things that are of great value, of great cost to you. But what I want to submit to you, brothers and sisters, is that if it's to follow Christ, then any cost is worth it. So the challenge for us, brothers and sisters, is as these moments come in our lives where we have to deny ourselves of certain things, it's all about following Him. It's all about listening to Him. It's all about seeking Him. Now this might seem like a very abstract concept, but I, I really want us, when we, when we go into prayer, to really look in terms of where God is leading us right now. Are we following our path? Or are we trying to engage God? Or are we trying to engage Christ and say, lead me, show me. Help me to put away the things that are distracting me. And help me to follow you and you. That's going to be different for each, for each and every one of us. But I really want us to take some time to, to look into what are these things? What are these ambitions that we have? And what does it really mean for us to follow Christ? So let's take some time to pray into this. And we'll go ahead and uh, close for the day. But um, let's go ahead and take some time to pray. So let, let's take some time to pray and just be reminded first and foremost that Jesus 
came as the anointed one and was willing to pay the greatest cost for us. And there will be times in our lives, maybe even now, where we have to pay a cost to continue to follow Him, to continue to seek after Him. And just as He suffered, there may be times, because we live in a world that does not know Him, because we live in a world that is sinful and adulterous, that will bring suffering into our lives. So the question we need to ask ourselves, are we willing to continue to follow Him even at that cost, even at that suffering, even at that discomfort? So I want us to take some time to pray into what we're currently doing, the walk that we're currently facing, and ask God, what are the things that I need to deny myself of? And really, most importantly, what do I need to do to follow you right now? Let's pray. in our lives where we would see the reality of who Jesus is that 
there would be no question, that there would be no denial, but that we would know the truth, and that truth will continue to set us free each and every day. Help us to know you in that way, and help us to follow you. We thank you. We praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's time.